Well, today we begin a brand new series called Masks. Masks, kind of appropriate this time of year. But we're going to be talking about masks and unmasking and pretending how that we are as followers of Jesus not to cover up, not to pretend, but to be open, to be real. And uh, we're going to talk about that. It's easy to pretend and cover up, isn't it? Especially coming to church. Now, that's really the opposite of the way it should be. When you think about it, most people who have sin, and all of us have sin, but people don't want anybody to find out at church that they got problems. In fact, they don't want, it seems like for many, the last place they want to go is church. The reason for that is that many times Christians will become judgmental. They will condemn and The Bible is very clear that covering up and pretending are sure fire ways to fail. Let me say that again. Covering up and pretending will guarantee failure in your life. You won't succeed. You will fail according to Scripture. Now, I want to give you three foundational principles that we're going to base this entire series on. Three foundational verses. Uh, Now, these are not my texts. This is not what I'm preaching from today, but I want to give them to you to show why we are uh, approaching this topic this way. Proverbs 28, verse 13, it says, you can't whitewash your sins and get by with it. You find mercy by admitting and leaving them. Oh, it's just a little white lie. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Has it ever dawned on you that there is no such thing as a little sin to God? No, I I realize that uh, Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment, the greatest thing. So if there's a greatest commandment, there's also a greatest sin. I I, I get that. And nobody is suggesting that lying to your kids about Santa Claus is the same as going out and murdering somebody. Nobody's suggesting that, okay? But the truth is, we need to understand that we can't cover up and expect success. Now, I do believe that you've got to be appropriate. Sometimes exposing things to the light of the gospel is to be done in Christian community, okay? It's to be done in small group with a pastor, with a friend, okay? You've got to learn to be appropriate. There are some places that are the right time and place to share. For example, let me just give you an example. When I was in college, uh, in Bible college, in my undergrad, um, we would have chapel services, and one day this guy preached about confessing your sins, and we had a young man get up in front of the entire chapel, and he said, I just have to tell you, he got his Jimmy Swaggart voice on, you know. He's like, I just got to tell you, I've been really struggling with some sins. And everybody said, amen, brother. And uh, he says, I've really been struggling with lust. And they're like, oh, my brother, <laughs> you know. And uh, he kept going. He kept going. He said, I've been, I've been thinking wicked, evil thoughts. And people were like, oh, help him, Lord. Oh, help him, Lord. And he went a little too far. He says, and I've been thinking about you and you and you. And I'm like, whoa, let's shut this thing down. <laughs> a little too much information there, friend. So what we're saying is uh, learn that Some of this is done in Christian community. You don't cover up, but you expose it to the light of the gospel. James 5, 16. Therefore, make it your habit to confess your sins to one another and to pray for one another another so that you may be healed. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, understand that in the context in this passage, he's talking about healing, physical healing. But I believe the application can be made spiritually as well, emotionally as well. Because when you walk around with this pent up, when you walk around covering up, what happens? Well, it'll affect your health. And that, that's not the main point. The main point is uh, in this that people were coming to the church to be, to be healed. And he would have the pastors, the elders of the church to anoint them and to pray for them. And he talked about the power of confessing your sins to one another. In other words, if it relieves physically, it also relieves spiritually and emotionally, right? I mean, you must understand that God said that when you do this, it's powerful and effective. And then 
Romans 8, 1. We read this this morning. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So uh, to, to build this foundation, let me just say this. Understand that our goal here at this church is to be a loving, open, uh, open-armed church, if you will, okay? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, do we all get it perfect? No, we do not. Sometimes we judge others. And let me tell you, the longer you're a Christian, the more apt you are to forget what you used to be like. And the longer you're a Christian, you'll make judgmental statements, looks. We used to say uh, several years ago when we had a lot of younger staff that uh, if, uh, you know, if you have a tattoo at this church, you're probably on staff, all right? So uh, if you don't have a tattoo, you're probably just a visitor, all right? So, um, and, and the point being this, you, you can be very judgmental looking at others, sometimes just with our look. Now, once again, that doesn't mean that you cannot make value judgments or uh, that you have to embrace sin. That is not what Scripture teaches. Being clear about sin is a biblical command in the same way, okay? Doesn't mean that we just, just because culture says this particular thing is right, that we agree with that, okay? So that's not what he's talking about. But you don't cover up your sin. There's great power in exposing your sins and weaknesses to the light of Christian community. Hiding behind a mask makes us defenseless. You cannot prosper. Um, the enemy wants you to believe that you've got to hide and pretend. That's what he wants. But you know, some of the statements we make here at this church, we embrace the mess. It may not have dawned on you yet, but life is messy. There are no perfect people. And just because that person sins differently than you do doesn't make, are you with me on that? All right. Sometimes we like, we single out kind, certain kinds of sins and we forget to single out our own, right? So um, we embrace the mess. We are better together, we say that. And this is a part of the importance of small group community. You're likely not gonna get this kind of discipleship on Sunday morning alone. Now you need to come to church on Sunday morning. You need to worship God on Sunday morning. You need to watch. But look, the bottom line is that you and I are not going to get the full experience that God has for us if we're not a part of a small group of Christians that can speak into our lives and love us and pray with us and pray for us. It's very, very important, okay? And there are many ways to get that. Being on a ministry team, being in a small group, uh, being a part of a church where you're involved. Man, there are so many stories of this and I could spend hours just giving you examples of what has happened in our church, of how people have gotten involved and how that they have found Christian community and they're better off for it today. And uh, so then one of my favorite sayings here at Stillwater Church is that this is the perfect place for imperfect people. And uh, if you're wondering you're not in a church full of perfect people. If you're new here or if you're watching online thinking about joining us here, I just want to warn you, there are no perfect people here. Your pastor is not perfect. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> but this place is filled with imperfect people. And if the church is a place that embraces the gospel that embraces what Jesus has for us, that embraces Scripture, then not only are we going to get the gospel out and reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ, we're going to see people grow in their faith to the point that there is radical change in their life. That's called becoming a disciple and becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Well, today, we're going to talk about the mask of fear. We all have a mask of fear, and our text is Psalm 3. 
I made a mistake. I just caught this this morning. I think on the screens it's probably going to say Psalm 8, but it's Psalm 3, okay? And the verses are from Psalm 3. So if you're one of those people that likes to come correct me afterwards, I just corrected myself, okay? So, so keep your comments to yourself, that's what I'm saying. Uh, well, this psalm is about, it's about an event in the life of David, King David. You know who David was, right? The one that killed Goliath, became the warrior king of Israel. He killed Goliath as a teenager. Now, that's pretty impressive. He was successful. You know that he had defeated every nation state that he fought against. He had never lost a war, ever. He was a very powerful king. Uh, he was wealthy. He had tremendous success. He had beautiful children. We know that. One of his sons, Absalom, it said that he was so handsome that he was the most handsome man in the entire country. That's what the Bible says, okay? He was the most handsome man in the entire country. In fact, he grew his hair long, and he got his hair cut once a year. And his hair was so full that it weighed several pounds. Now, I don't know how much hair you've got to have to have several pounds of hair, but the dude was handsome, all right? He had a beautiful family, and uh, if you read it, you would think he was a superhero, but you're going to find when we read this psalm that he had fears just like you and I do. Now, Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. It probably says that in your Bible. Um, and let me, let me give you some context, okay, to explain what was happening. David had been king for a long time. He had been very successful. And all of a sudden, his son, the good-looking one, Absalom, rose up in rebellion against his father. Now, all of us have had if you have kids, you've had some rebellious moments probably, as, especially as they're teenagers, as they get a little bit older, okay? Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, you, you, yes, you, all right? So, got a teenager down here saying, no, 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 not me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you, all right? So, but no, seriously, he had all of this rebellion against his father, but it went beyond the normal parent-child relationship. Because Absalom began to be so rebellious that he began to try to take the throne from his father. In fact, not only did he try, he got successful at it. And he deposed David as king for a short time. And not only that, he was trying to kill his own father. Now, I've heard of family dysfunction, but that, that's up there, okay? And, and the truth is, um, he had uh, a lot of problems, and David was afraid. We're going to find out in this little psalm that he was afraid. And we're going to find out what we do to come out from behind the mask of fear. I would say that it would be accurate to describe the fears that David had as similar to the kinds of fears we all face today. For example... I'm sure nobody here is king, and nobody here probably has killed Goliath with a slingshot, okay? But think about the kinds of problems or fears that King David had. He had financial problems. He was wealthy, and now he was broke. He w was living in a palace. Now he was living in a cave. Financial problems. I doubt many of you have gone from living in the palace to living in a cave, all right? He had a lot of problems, financial problems. Uh, he also had family problems, like I told you, with his son. Incredible family problems. Many of us have family problems. He had problems with his friends. Uh, there were colleagues of his that used to be on his side that completely now were trying to help Absalom kill David. Man, and, and you thought that somebody putting a mean comment on Facebook was bad, all right? This guy was having people trying to literally kill him. He had reputation problems. He had health problems. He said, where do you get that from? Well, normally when people are trying to cut your head off with a sword, that's not good for your health, all right? I'm just saying, all right? Uh, dying is a health problem. 
So uh, we could make the application to our own lives, financial problems, family problems, problems with friends, problem with our reputation, problem with our health. He had work problems, he had discouragement, and he had failure. Can you imagine what that felt like? To have been king. Uh, they wrote songs about him when he was a teenage boy. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. I, that's heady stuff for a kid, okay? He was the apex of success in everything he did. He was good at being a shepherd. He killed a lion. He killed a bear, it says, with his hands or with a club. I've never tried that, but that's a pretty tough dude, okay? So he's tough. He's handsome. The Bible called him ruddy. He was good looking. Uh, he was strong. He was very popular. He was uh, a poet. He was a song singer, songwriter. I mean, what is it that David couldn't do? He was amazing. But he had failed. Can you imagine what that felt like going from the palace to now being run, on the run for your life to now being living in a cave? Imagine it was a real struggle for him. So he was accused of things he didn't do. And then I'm going to show, show you in a moment what they said about him, which some people will say about you too. And so what did he do? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a verse or two, and then I'm going to make a comment. And I'm going to read some more. I'll make another comment, and we'll go that way, okay? Beginning in verse 1, Psalm 3. Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? And that's the reason I read it with that inflection. Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? You ever been there? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul. Here's what they said. There's no salvation for him in God. Oh, he's getting what he deserves. Oh, he just thought he was getting away with the stuff he did, but God's catching up with him. They're going to say things like that. They're going to say things like that about you. And then he puts in this little word. It's an interesting word. Um, there's really no English equivalent for this word, but the word selah. And let me tell you what it means. It's a musical or poetic term. They put it in songs uh, back in those days. They put it in poems. And here was the point. When you said Selah, you were to pause and think about it for a minute. You were to think about it. What do you think about that? So, so let's read it again as if he's talking to these very same people that are bringing misery to him. Here's what he said. Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Well, what do you think about that? Well, I'll tell you what I think about it. He admitted his fear. That's the first step to taking off the mask of fear. He admitted that he did have fear. Now, there's nothing wrong with admitting that. In fact, it's the true, the first step of unmasking yourself. He didn't have all the answers. Now, there are some of us that don't like to get help. We think we can figure everything out on our own. We have been the type that have pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We know that if we work hard enough and we're judicious enough and we're determined enough, we're going to work a way out of our problems. Now, and I'm not against hard work. You should work hard. And I'm not against being industrious. You should be industrious. But if you think you've got the answer to everything, you're wrong. And David admitted this, and it was his first step to healing. He said, people are saying about me that God has forsaken me. Man, there are people that are going to say things about you. I, as a pastor, I've had people say things about me that were just so off the wall, but they're still hurtful. I've had people tell me that I am a, a heretic. And I'm like, you don't even know what that word means, do you? All right. I've had people tell me, well, you don't preach the gospel. Now, never mind that they never heard me preach, okay? But they said I didn't preach the gospel. That hurt my feelings. I didn't like that because that is absolutely not true. And my commitment is to the centrality of the gospel and Jesus in everything that we do. But yet people are going to say things about you. They're going to misunderstand you. They're going to make mean comments about you. But understand what 
David was doing. He said, Lord, I got problems. There's a lot of people against me. This is not my fault. I don't have control. But I want you to get something. Here's what I believe. What God was doing, and we can see it working out in his spiritual life here as he writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God was getting him to a point to deal with his fear. And I'm going to give it to you. And this is the worth the price of admission. Okay. There's one thing. If you don't get anything but this, leave here with this. Tuck this away in your brain. Think about it this week. God wanted him to get to the point where his faith trumped the facts in his life. Let me say that again. God wanted David to get to the point where his faith trumped the facts in his life. Now, what are the facts? You've got fears. What are the facts? You've got problems. It'll be a health problem. It'll be a financial problem. It'll be a family problem. I don't care if you live long enough, you're going to have problems. And there, that's a fact, okay? And you are not to be like an ostrich with your head in the sand and deny that and float along in life as if God wakes you up every morning to the sound of angels' wings, all right? You're not perfect and no one thinks you are, so quit acting like it, Okay? But God does want you to get to the point where you trust him. No matter what the fear is, no matter what the problem is, faith should always trump facts. You see this worked out in the Bible all throughout Scripture. Okay? Remember the Israelites when they got delivered from Egypt and they were free at last, right? And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh's army is behind them. They got a mountain on this side a mountain on this side, and the Red Sea in front of them. You know what they started doing? Oh, you just brought us out here to kill us. There weren't enough graves in Egypt. You just brought us out here to slaughter us and leave us in the desert. Funny how the people of God often say ridiculous things, isn't it? But God said, just stand still and know that I'm God. And God told Moses to hold up the staff that it was in his hand and he split the sea and they walked across on dry ground. Here's the point. Faith always should trump facts. What was the fact? They were in a pickle. They were in trouble. It did not look good, but they trusted God. Here's what I want you to understand. Sometimes the things that we worry about most are the least problematic to God. I want you to understand that, okay? We need to admit our fear. Well, let me go on. Uh, the next verse. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. That's an odd saying. I don't believe there are any misplaced words in Scripture. I believe all uh, Scripture is inspired by God. Listen to this. He didn't say you're a shield for me. He said you're a shield about me. He didn't say you're a shield in front of me. Why? About me means that he's got you covered on all sides. Because, you know, you get the shield out in front of you, a wise enemy is going to come around and stab you in the back. And a lot of Christians, they'll have the shield of faith out in front of them, and uh, they don't realize that the devil sneaks around with the fiery darts of the wicked, and he stabs them in the wallet, all right, and it just kills them, all right? But here, here's the point. He is a shield about me. He's got you covered. He's got you all the way around. He said, um, my glory and the lifter of my head, I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah, what do you think about that? Oh, all these people are saying, God's even angry at him. What do you think about that? Oh, I tell you, God's got me. God's gonna lift my head. God's got my back. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? In our times of fear, the most important thing is that we do exactly what David did. We turn to God. You know, I found that there are a lot of Christians that are tempted to turn away from God during their troubles. Is that the way it's going to be? And we began to kind of talk about how much we've done for God, which is really kind of funny when you think about it. Telling the creator of the universe Telling Jesus who died on the cross for your sins, 
uh, telling the one that is the personification of perfection, the holy God of the universe, how good you are. You ever dawn, has it ever dawned on you how silly that is? It's really nuts, to be honest with you. But the truth is, God wants you to understand something that when you and I turn to him, okay, uh, in our time of trouble, that he will help us. It's during your difficult days, during your dark days, you should turn to God, not away from him. Don't run from him, run to him. That's the way to get help. What did David learn? We, what we see from this passage, God's our protector, he's my shield. God alone gives success He has a plan. He said, you are my glory. When you begin to understand that God has a plan for your life and that his plans are a lot better than your plans, then you'll you'll get along a whole lot better. And then God alone brings true assurance. He said this, and I love this. He's the lifter of my head. The lifter of my head. You ever have to lift your kid's head up to look at you? Maybe they did something wrong and they don't want to look you in the eye. They just kind of look down and you just lift their head. Why do you do that? You do that to communicate with them. You do that to let them know that you love them. Uh, You ever seen a person that's just down and they're just all down in the dumps and, and you lift their head? What is lifting the head? It means to encourage them, to let them know they're loved, to let them know that things are going to be okay, to let them know that they're, they've got blessings coming, okay? And uh, God is the lifter of my head. He alone brings true assurance. Now, we live in a culture that wants to get assurance from all different kinds of things. But understand what Scripture is teaching us here, that God alone is the lifter of our head. Kim and I were talking this morning. Uh, She was putting on her makeup, as you do before you come to church, right? And um, I asked her a question because it's just, you know, these weird random thoughts come to my head from time to time, I asked her, I said, why do they call it makeup? And she didn't miss a beat. She said, because you want to make up for how bad you look, all right? So, (laughs) like, okay. Or she said, you want to make up, you know, the way you want to look. Well, we live in a culture that uh, we make up, don't we? I mean, you know, we want to, we want to edit, we want to pretend, we want to filter. Have you ever noticed Now, ladies, I'm not telling on you, but I am kind of, all right? So, uh, I've noticed that most women's pictures on places like Facebook or social media, they take the picture like that somebody climbed up into the ceiling. (laughs) And for the longest time, I couldn't understand. I was like, what is that about? And once again, my wife educates me on this. She said, because, you know, that's the better angle. You can't see the double chin, you know? And I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense. But you know what we do? We want to filter. We want to, we want to get our confidence. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't wear makeup or fix your hair or do whatever it is. Use whatever power tools you need in the morning to get ready, okay? Uh, some of those things, I'd stay away from them. I love tools. I got a lot of tools out in my shed. But I don't know what some of these tools that you, you, you women use are. And I just kind of leave them alone, all right? But I'm not suggesting you shouldn't get ready and look pretty and, and all that. What I'm saying is your confidence does not come from the makeup or the way you look or how many likes you get. It comes from the Lord. That's what he's saying. And when I understand that, it changes everything. And then I want to point out something to you you may not have thought of before. When you have fear, you focus on the gospel, and it helps conquer the fear. You say, where in the world do you get that? Well, when he said, your holy hill, that I'm coming to your holy hill, that is a reference to Mount Zion, which is also in the Bible called the city of God, Mount Zion, Um, And and what does that represent? Well, all throughout Scripture, it represents literally God's plan. Uh, It represents the cross. It represents salvation. It represents the kingdom of God. It represents your relationship with God. 
okay? Now, when you read this and you understand what David was saying was that I'm going to build my life around the truth of the gospel. I'm going to build my life around my relationship with God Almighty. I, when I get into trouble, when I get afraid, I'm going to look to God. I'm not going to look to my circumstances. It makes a difference. Well, then he goes on and says something incredible. Now, keep in mind, he'd been in a cave. There were probably 50, 60,000 soldiers with Absalom. Do you know how many David had with him? 600. Now, I'm no mathematician, but if I'm taking odds, I'm going to go with the 60,000, not the 600, okay? But I want you to see what David did. And the reason for this was simple because he trusted God. He had taken off the mask and he had turned it to God. He said, I lay down and slept. Really? I mean, you're used to being in a palace with the most comfortable bed and with uh, singers to sing you to sleep, uh, with uh, the best food, whatever you want is at your fingertips, people there to serve you. Now you're in a cave. They're about to kill you. And what do you do? Oh, I just laid down and slept. You know, many of us, we can't even hardly get a good night's sleep. And we got all the good things going for, on, uh, for us in our lives. And David was on the verge. But he said, I just laid down and slept. And I woke again. Just another day. Just some peace. Why? For the Lord sustained me. The Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Third thing is he declared his faith. You want to take off the mask of fear? Declare your faith in God. Focusing on his faith brought incredible peace. Um, now he had the courage to face, to face incredible odds. And this is why I want you to see when you have the peace of God in your life, you can face great odds. You can face great problems. You can come through it. And God wants you to declare your faith in him. You want to take off the mask? He doesn't say pretend not to have fear. We all have fear. But he said, I want you to get to the point where your faith trumps your facts and you trust in me. And David spoke it. I'm trusting in God. Maybe you should try that. Whatever your problem is, whatever insurmountable odds you're facing, just try trusting God. See, declare it. See what happens. And then he said, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Pretty strong language. But you know what David was doing? He was assigning this to God. He wasn't trying to take matters into his own hands. He was trusting God. He gave up control and trusted God for the outcome. When you and I do that, we take our hands off, we give up control, and trust God for the outcome. Do you know the Bible is so full of these kinds of commands? Uh, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. We're not to be the ones taking vengeance. He said, Lord, I'm going to give up control of this because Control, for the most part, in most of the things in our life, is an illusion anyway. You don't even control much at all in your life. I know you think you do, but how many of you have ever gotten stuck in Atlanta traffic? Let me see your hand, okay? You don't really control a lot. Now, maybe you control your desire to ram in front of the car in front of you because they're driving so bad, but the fact is we have a lot less control than we want to admit David gave up control, and he trusted God for the outcome. Are you willing to do that? If you do, then God will do what David talked about next. And here's the last thing. David said, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord and your blessing upon your people. And I love how he ended this little psalm. So what do you think about that? <laughs> so David starts out, oh, there's so many people around me that are against me. What do you think about that? 
they're saying bad things about me. They say that not even God loves me. What do you think about that? Well, I'm going to trust you, God. What do you think about that? The Lord is the one who's able to deliver. He's the one who lifts my head. What do you think about that? And it gets all the way down to the final conclusion of everything. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What do you think about that? You see, when we get to that point, it begins to change everything, doesn't it? It begins to change everything. You see, the fact is, when you turn it over to God, when you trust Him, you got numbers on your side. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. When I was in second grade, I know some of you think this is a miracle that I can even remember that. It's been so long. But there was a bully in our classroom. I know that we read a lot about bullying and stuff, but back when I was growing up, bullying happened in the classroom or on the playground, not on social media because we didn't have social media. And I remember this kid, he was, um, he was three years older than everybody else in the class. Now, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on his intellectual capacity, okay? But I'm going to go out on a limb to say that the words, I'll take Shakespearean literature for a thousand, Alex, never came out of that guy's mouth, okay? Just going to say, all right? He was three years older. He had failed three times back in the day when I guess they didn't just automatically pass you or whatever. But and this poor kid, he was, um, he was a bully. Not only was he older, he was bigger. And he had a mean streak in him. And uh, he would pick on every kid, me included. One day we were on the playground and he was on top of me, holding me down. He had beat me up. And he looked at me and said this. I'll never forget this. He said, have you had enough? And I looked up at him. I said, I sure have. And he got off of me and I went on, well, you know, I told my mom, and she was like, why did you, that was back in the day when, you know, all the kids didn't get kicked out of school for fighting, all right? You get in trouble with your parents for not standing up for yourself. That was, I realized it many eons ago, okay? But I can remember that. And I told my mom and my dad, and they said, well, why don't you do something about it? And I'm like, like what? And they said, well, you know, you can get, a bunch of boys together and let him know that he's not to do that anymore. So the next day at school, I got 10 of my friends together in the second grade class and we ganged up on this little boy. And as I'm telling this story, I'm realizing some of you are thinking, oh my God, what is wrong with this pastor, okay? <laughs> I'm not suggesting violence. I'm just trying to make a point, okay? Uh, but we, we dogpiled him. We didn't, we didn't beat him up. We just dogpiled him and we told him, that he was never to pick on us again. And you know what happened? He listened. He never messed with us again. Now, I don't know if you have an experience like that in your life, but here's what I know. When God's on your side, when you turn it over to him, when you let God be in control and you leave the outcome to him, you always outnumber the bully. You always outnumber the enemy, and God said that he will bring salvation. Well, let's pray together. Before I pray, I wonder what the Holy Spirit is saying to you today. Maybe there's a fear that you've been grappling with, and this was exactly what you needed to hear. Maybe you need to turn that over to the Lord. Maybe today you need to receive Christ. You're not sure if you're on your way to heaven or not, and you know that you need redemption. You need saving. I would encourage you today that you would pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. And I don't understand everything about the Bible or you, but I do believe that I, when I ask you, you'll listen. And so I'm asking you to save me right now. I'm, I'm giving my life. I'm committing my life to you today. If you'll say something like that to God in the room, fill out the next step card, drop it in the drop box on the way out, or give it to one of our prayer team members afterwards. Online, do it at the bottom of the screen there. Let us know that you prayed to receive Christ. But God promised that if you would ask him, he would save you. And so whatever it is that you're dealing with today, maybe it's salvation, maybe it's fear, maybe it's 
uh, getting involved. You've, you've heard me talk about participation is membership, and you want to step in and step up. Whatever it is, commit it to the Lord. And at the end of the service today, we have our prayer team that is over to my left to your right on the way out. If you want to pray with them about anything, it can be about anything, they're going to be there to help you and assist you. Heavenly Father, help us today. Thank you that we've, we've been a long ways in this service. We've worshiped you. We've taken communion. We've heard teaching from the Word of God. We've been challenged by the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you'd help us to do exactly what the Word of God says. Help us to believe that we are who it says we are. And God, will thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.